But today we're going to be talking about this, that the church must be known as a people of prayer, a people of prayer. What's really interesting is that originally I was going to title this message, A Place of Prayer. The church should be known as a place of prayer. But actually, things have changed. See, in the Old Testament, you would go to the temple and you would or go to synagogue and you would pray. It was a holy place. It was a place where sacred things were done. But according to the New Testament, things have changed. That because of the new covenant made by Jesus' shed blood, we understand this, that it is not a place that we go to pray but it is a people that pray. Let me help you understand that according to the word of God in 1 Corinthians, it says to you and I that we are now the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit resides in us. So understand that you don't have to go to church to pray. You can pray anywhere you are, that you can take the things that are holy. You can take the things that are sacred. And let me just say it's left the building, okay? Not like Elvis, but it's left the building. Here's the idea though, is that we are carriers of the spirit of God and that there is power in our prayers. And so we must become known as a praying people. And I know that with me talking about prayer, just mentioning that I've already lost some of you. Some of you are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I, oh man, like, is this one of those messages, like five steps to get closer to God? No, it's not. You know, is this like how to pray and and how to intercede for, you know, hours and hours? No, it's not that. Because I've lost some of you because here's your prayer life. I start to pray and about five seconds in, your ADD kicks in, right? And you're thinking about, you know, the, the shower curtain and you're thinking about how there's an oil stain in the garage and how, you know, there's a, a gopher in your backyard and you're like, oh man, and then you feel bad. Come on, am I speaking to anybody here? Some of you, you start praying and about four or five minutes in, it's like you're tossing and turning all night long and you can't sleep and then you start praying about three seconds in, you're asleep, right? You're like, man, like, I don't know what it is. Prayer is just boring to me puts me to sleep. Can we confess that in church? Come on, we're a real church. Sometimes, come on, we get bored. Sometimes we fall asleep. Sometimes we're distracted. And what I want you to understand today when we're going to talk about prayer is that there's another gear. There's another gear that I want to talk to you about, something that can engage and invigorate your prayer life. Because how many fighters do we got in here? Any of you, will you guys fight and defend somebody that you love? Come on, how, how many mama bears we got in here that you would fight for your children? Well, I want you to understand that actually you can take a fighting mentality into your prayer life. I want you to see this. See, I don't know about you, but I, I couldn't stand bullies when I was growing up. Anybody like that? You just couldn't stand bullies? You know, I couldn't stand, like even in youth group, it used to irritate me where we'd go to camp and people would play practical jokes and put, you know, toothpaste in people's shoes. Come on, I'm not giving ideas to young people. But, but people, you know, things would happen. I was just like, I was like, really? Like that for a cheap laugh? You know, you're going to destroy somebody's self-esteem over like a funny moment? And so I never enjoyed being around bullies. And in fact, like I, I became one that was like, man, I want to knock you out. And it was interesting. I had a younger brother. Or I have a younger brother. And, you know, people at times, they would try to bully him in the neighborhood. And I'm going to tell you, I was one that was like, I was fiercely loyal. And I would insert myself between others. Anybody, can I get a witness? You're that kind of person. And I want you to understand that that's the same concept of prayer. This, see, with my brother, if somebody tried to come against him, it was like, Houston, we got a problem. And, and in the same way that you can insert yourself in prayer between whatever it is that is coming against those that you love, you can put yourself right in the middle. And I want you to see this in Scripture. In 1 Timothy 2, this is really where we're launching from, 1 Timothy 2, 1, it says this. It says, I urge you then first of all. He's saying first of all. He's making this so important. He's placing emphasis on this. He says that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. I want you to see this, this word intercession. This is so valuable and this will change your prayer life, my friend. Instead of you being like, Lord, please bless this food. I know that it's bad for my body, you know, but just somehow, some way, please don't let it kill me. And sometimes we're praying about money. We're praying about, you know, Lord, would you just please give me a can of Act Right so I can open it up on my husband? You know, you're just thinking of all these things. But here's the thing that I want you to get. That intercession will change your life. And it's not what you think. See, the way that I was raised, intercession was people that prayed for hours and hours and hours and hours, and that's all they wanted to do. But I want you to see it differently today because it will unlock something. It's going to open another gear in your life. See, we pray first of all. Why? Because prayer is always our first move because it's our best move, my friend. Prayer is always our first move because it's our best move. And so we must get this. But what I want you to see today when it comes to praying and interceding for people, 
prayers of intercession is the prefix of, of enter means between or among. I want you to get this today, that the prefix of enter, interceding, means that you are between, you're purposely placing yourself between somebody and something, or you're, person, you're, you're putting yourself between God and a problem. You're interjecting yourself, just as for me, if I saw somebody picking on my brother, I didn't hesitate at all. I was like, what? Right, come on, you guys have that same thing. If somebody comes and you see somebody trying to do something to your kid, you moms, come on, you come up. Wait, wait, can I help you? What's going on? You don't hesitate to interject yourself or to intercede or intervene in that situation, right? I hope that you're getting what I'm putting down right here is that that is the way that we live. That is your intercessory prayer is that you put yourself intentionally in the middle between a holy God and other people that you war on behalf of them. You step into the intersection between their problem and a great God. God that can solve their problem. Is this making sense to anybody today? So this is the way that we pray. Do you realize that there's people in our city today that woke up and nobody's prayed for them? Do you realize that there's people in our nation, there's people in your family that nobody has interceded for today? Nobody has stepped into the gap. Nobody has said, you know what? If nobody's praying for them, then I'm going to pray for them. And guys, I'm telling you that if we are a people of prayer, this must be our heart, that the enemy is not going to bully my family. The enemy is not going to bully my city. It's not going to bully my state or my nation, that I will be one that stands in the middle. I will purposely, without hesitation, daily put myself in that place. Can you see how that's different than, Lord, bless my food? You know, God, please, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, that we shouldn't petition God. But this supercharges your prayer life. Why? Because if you hate bullies, then you've got work to do. That you stand in the gap. And here's the thing is that our role is to intercede and God's is to intervene. Do you see this? That our role is to intercede and it's God's role to intervene. How does this work? Is that if I am here and I know God, if this is my family member that is struggling, they're addicted, they're lost, something's going on, and I put myself in the middle, and this is God. By faith, I put myself in the middle through faith and prayer, trusting that if I call upon my God, that my God will then intervene, and he puts himself between the person and the problem that they're facing. See, I can't solve their problem. I can't fix their addiction. I can't fix their brokenness. I can't fix the wounding or the pain, but I know the one who can. So what I do is I step in and do my part. I intercede and call upon God, and what God does is he steps right in the middle of their circumstances and change what no one can change on their own. So think about how this changes somebody's prayer life. And see, God is calling and he's looking for people that are willing to stand in the gap. He's looking for people that are willing to intervene and to intercede. See, Ezekiel 22, going all the way back to the Old Testament, Ezekiel 22, 30 says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap between, before me and on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Let that not be us, guys, that as we're watching our nation in a very difficult situation, as we're watching drug abuse just run rampant and we're seeing the brokenness of generation after generation, the fatherlessness, the violence, all of the things that we're facing, we can stand back and be like, ah, well, you know, ah, that's just people, right? This is how people do things, man. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Ah, you know, I just carry on with my life. Got to make that bread. I got to make that money and just carry on. Or we can be a people that say, you know what, God, I... You're looking for one, you found him. You're looking for her, you found her. We are a church, we are a praying people that are willing to stand in the middle on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our land, that this should never be said about the church of the living God, that he looked for someone and he found no one. But it should be said that I looked for them and I found a whole bunch of them at Hub City Church. I saw a whole bunch of them worldwide that were praying, people that were willing to intercede on behalf of broken people. So this is important that we get this. We must be a praying people. So what do we intercede for? I'm glad you asked. Paul actually addresses this as he's writing to Timothy. And we find this in verse two. He gives us a few people that we should be praying for and a few things that we should be praying for. So he says in 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, remember, he said to pray, to petition. He says to intercede. He says to give thanksgiving for all. He says, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. 
Here's the first thing that we're going to be praying for. And for some of you, this may make you feel a little uncomfortable in church, but let me just say it shouldn't. We're going to pray for our political leaders and authorities. We're going to pray, if I can get my next slide up, we're going to pray for our political leaders and authorities. This is so important. And like I said, many times people go, oh, here goes the church getting political. That's not it at all. But let me just say this. I will never tell you as your pastor who to vote for, but I have an obligation to speak the truth of the word of God into your life and also show you from the word of God how to make wise decisions. That is my role. And so I'm not going to be shy about it. And let me just say this, in the months to come, we will be talking about the upcoming election. And for some of you, like I said, this makes you uncomfortable, but it shouldn't. You know, many people, the idea of the separation between church and state, it's been cleverly misinterpreted by people and of people of, of positions of power who oppose Christianity. Have you realized that very rarely do you see people attacking Muslims? Do you, you rarely see them attacking New Agers? You rarely see them attacking Hindus, Sikhs? You rarely, you know, Buddhists? You, you don't see a whole lot, but you will always see in the news that there's somebody attacking Christianity. And I want you to understand, this is a spiritual fight. There is a reason for that. Why? Because we hold the truth. We hold the truth. And that the enemy is not going to fight and mess with stuff that is ineffective. He's going to fight against the thing that poses the greatest threat towards his kingdom. And so we must understand that we shouldn't shy away from this. The separation between church and state has been twisted. It's been manipulated to where we go, oh, well, we can't have the church in the state and anything that's involved. But in all actuality, when that was put in place, it was to help the church. It was to strengthen and bolster the church. It was meant that the state couldn't come in and create laws that would discriminate against the church. But we have now twisted it. But let me remind you, that in 1964, through the Civil Rights Act, that religion is a protected class. And as Christians, we have the right to believe what we believe and worship our God without discrimination, persecution, or the fear of retribution, my friend. And some of you, this isn't enlightening to you because you don't understand this. You've only, you've been fed hook, line, and sinker certain agendas and mindsets. You're like, well, that's just what it is. But I want to enlighten you. I want to teach you the truth that you have a right I have a right to worship God according to the Bible in an unadulterated, an unadulterated way. I, the, the, the world doesn't get to dictate what we believe. The world doesn't get to dictate how we worship our God, how we pray, what we believe, what is, that, what is okay and what's not okay. Only God gets to do that. And I want you to understand that the government does not have a right to come against and impose their ways or their views on us. So here's what I'm going to challenge you to do in the months ahead is pray for wisdom, discernment, and we must intercede for America. Let me just talk to you guys about how dire this is, because Christianity is one generation away from extinction in America. See, Christianity is thriving in South Africa all across the, the continent of Africa, actually. It's thriving in Iran right now. Christianity is thriving in South America. Christianity is thriving in China, but it's dying off in the Western world. And we must stand in the gap and believe for our generations. And let me just say this, that the, the downturn in many ways has been that we've been conditioned by the media. We've been conditioned by liberal universities to focus on what we call identity politics. What do I mean by that? is that this is a sleight of trick, hand, uh, is a sleight of hand trick. That we've been coerced into focusing on the appearance, focus on the skin color, focus on the race, focus on the gender, focus on the likability and the outer persona of our leaders, focus on, on the perceived flaws, focus on their blunders and their shortcomings. And what we're doing is we've been conditioned to look at the external and to avoid looking at the internal. And this is so damaging. Do you realize that this is a trap? Because what it does is sets us up to have these emotional connections to a political party and even emotional allegiances. A lot of you don't realize that you vote a certain way because it's like you're voting for your favorite football team. I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan and they're terrible every year. But there's something in me that I'm like, oh man, I'm just like, I'm going for the Cowboys, man. It's the, it's the blue and the silver, let's go. 
But let me tell you that your generations are at stake and that when you vote, you're not voting for a football team. You're not voting for a baseball team. This has ramifications that will spread for generations and generations. You cannot be attached emotionally to a candidate or to a party if you're not willing to actually look at what they're doing, not just the outside persona. This is why it's so important. Listen to this thought. Is that a chess match... A chess match is not won or lost by the appearance of the pawns, but by the moves made on the board. Let me say it again, because let this sink in. A chess match is not won by or lost by the appearance of the pawns, but by the moves made on the board. Do you understand that through, through this you know, identity politics, you've been conditioned to look at the pawns? Oh, this pawn is great. Oh, man, they're amazing. Oh, man, what a... But, you're, but here's the thing is, here's the sleight of hand, is that you're focused on a party. You're focused on a person. Well, oh, she's a woman, or oh, he's a man, or hey, they're, they're this, or they're that. And you're focused on the pawn, and they're over here making moves, and you're not discerning the moves. And we need to wake up as a church. We must be discerning. We must be wise according to the word of God. And Paul knew this. And this is why he said this as he lays it out in chapter two, verse two. Let's go back to that. He says, we pray for kings and all those in authority. He says that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. There's two things that you should be praying for. There's two things that you should be uh, interceding for when it comes to our political leaders is that you must be praying for leaders with a heart for peace. You must be praying because he says that we want to live peacefully and quiet, right? You must be praying that God would bring leaders, not that say that they want peace, but that the moves that they make bring peace and that the, the moves that they make quench violence. See, there's a lot of people like, hey, well, if you vote for me, man, we're bringing peace. We're going to get in the inner cities. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's not about what they say. It's not about the way they look. It's about what they do. And you must have discernment to see it. And so we're going to pray that our leaders would be people that bring peace. The other thing that we're going to pray for is that we pray for leaders who promote godliness and holiness. Let me say again that we pray for leaders who promote godliness and holiness. This is a big deal, church. This is a big deal. We cannot continue to vote for people that are opening wide doors to wickedness and perversion and then call ourselves a believer. You're voting for the wrong team, my friend, and that doesn't even make sense. How do we vote against our own conscience? The way, the way it happens is that we embrace identity politics. That's how it happens. That you have believers that vote against the Bible but it's because we have a certain love. I've always voted this way. I've always voted for these people. And whatever you see, whether it's an R or a D, you just check the box. Listen, my friend, you must change. I must change. That cannot be the way that we vote anymore. Why is this important? And some of you, I know this is making you uncomfortable. Some of you, this is even like, oh, it's making me mad. Why? Because I'm stepping on your sacred cow and I'm bringing an ax to it right now. Because God is challenging your flesh right now to think and to live differently. Why? Because our generations are at stake, my friend. Do you realize that the way you vote establishes the laws which create the pathways that the generations behind us, that's what they walk on. That we are creating the life that that our children and our grandchildren, we're creating pathways that they will walk and run on. And here's the thing is that above every issue, you can have big issues. I've got issues, things that are important to me. It could be reproductive rights. It can be the border. It could be the economy. It can be all of these things. But there can never be an issue bigger than this issue. Is You must ask yourself, is if I vote for this person, will they make it easier for Christianity to thrive in America or make it harder? See, we have been called to be people that spread the good news and the gospel. There is no issue greater than that. That if we're voting for people that are leading and opening pathways to perversion and destruction, a wide road that leads to death, then I believe we'll be held accountable for that. What we have an obligation to do first is to establish and vote for people that will create a pathway for people to be able to come to church, to worship God, Yahweh, Yeshua, without any fear of persecution, without people coming against them and saying, if you don't, if you don't do what I say you do, then we're going to sue you. We're going to throw you in prison. We're going to do this. We're going to incriminate you. You guys, listen, that is your first obligation. And we must pray that we have leaders that are coming And we intercede on behalf, us, between the leaders and God, and saying, God, would you then intervene? 
See, here's the thing is some of you are going, well, yeah, but man, it just seems like the candidates, like whatever we're facing, it seems like they're all a little, little slimy. Guys, this is not a lost cause. Prayer is powerful. And the Bible says that God has the ability to turn the hearts of kings. And let me prove this to you. Let me prove this to you. See, when you begin to pray and intervene, God can change the hearts of some of these leaders that you maybe even look at and go, man, they're a wicked person. They're an evil person. They're an ugly person. See, he did it with King Darius. You had, you had Daniel who was praying to God. And there was a decree that went out that if anybody prayed to any other God other than King Darius, they would be thrown in the lion's den. And Daniel was bold and he stood up and said, nope, I will worship my God the way that he's called me to worship him. I will do it without shame and I will do it without fear. Well, there were ramifications to that. And King Darius, they rounded him up and threw him in the lion's den, stayed in there overnight. And God delivered Daniel from the mouth of the lions. This impacted Darius so much so that he had a change of heart. And I want you to see what he actually says in the word of God in Daniel chapter six. This is the words from an ungodly man. This is why I'm trying to say this. Some of you are going, yeah, but, but you know, how, how can Biden or how can Trump or how Kamala, how many of these people, like how could they ever be used of God? I'm just telling you, God used ungodly people. I'm not calling them ungodly, but what I'm saying is he used ungodly people for his purposes. And then they turned around and they declared this. This is what an ungodly man said. He says, I issue a decree. What he's saying is I'm writing a new law. The law I wrote before came against God, but now I'm writing a new law, a new decree. He says, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of who? Of Daniel. He says, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. This is an ungodly man declaring the goodness and the power and sovereignty of the living God. So don't think for a minute that your prayers, your intercession can't make a difference. We see with King Nebuchadnezzar, this guy was was immoral. Okay, he was a he was a womanizer. He was a drinker. They throw these parties that were just lavish and perverted. You're thinking, man, how could God use that guy? As a matter of fact, God actually makes him lose his mind. But it was through an act of God's grace that he gave him his sanity back. And his eyes were open. This ungodly man has this to say. I want you to see this. King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, an ungodly man, an ungodly king, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. There was a repentance in his heart. And he says, then I praised the most high. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Don't tell me that God can't change the heart of a king. Don't tell me that God can't change the heart of a governor. Don't tell me that God can't change the heart of a president. We must intercede and believe. Rather than throwing zingers and slinging stuff on social media and bashing and trashing people, we intercede. Why? Because as the church of the living God, we are a praying people. So as we move on, In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to tackle verses 3 and 6 as we close today. So Paul continues to write to Timothy, and I love this, when he says to pray for our kings and those in authority. He says, this is good and pleases God our Savior. Do you realize that as you pray for your authorities and your, your political leaders that it pleases the heart of God? Some of you are like, oh man, but like I said, church and state should, see, you've been misled. We very much have an influence and a role to play, but our role is that we go to the one who can really make changes because he can change the heart, not just the behavior. But listen to what he says. So this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all So not only do we pray for our political leaders and authorities, but the second group that he's asking us to pray for is those who are far from God. Those who are disconnected from God. Those who need a mediator. And this this is so important because 
there's three kinds of people that are distant from God, maybe more, but three that I've been able to identify. And maybe today you find yourself in this group, or maybe you know someone that is in this group. And let me say this, that there is no greater prayer to pray than to pray for somebody's soul. And what we find is that, that those who are distant from God usually fall into these three categories, the lost, the wandering, and the wounded. The lost, the wandering, and the wounded. And we must become a people that intercede, that we're willing to stand in the middle, stand in the gap for those who are completely and utterly lost. They are in a place of darkness, don't know God, don't care to know God, and they don't even know the peril that they're in. There's another group of people that are the wandering, that they know the father, but they've chosen to walk away like the prodigal son. That this son actually said, you know, I want my inheritance now. And he ended up leaving the father and going out into this place of brokenness and, and muck and mire and used his money on prostitutes and used his money on drinking. And, used, and he came to a place of brokenness. And maybe that's you today, that you serve God. Maybe you grew up in church. You were around the, the, the churchy stuff. But you found yourself being distracted. Maybe you took a detour and it led you down a really dark road. And you find yourself today very distant and far from God. I want you to know that you are here by divine appointment today, my friend. And there's others of you here today and maybe you feel distant from God because church represents a place of pain. You went to church and you thought that you would be loved. You heard the pastor say, man, come as you are. But then when they saw that you had a few issues or maybe some big issues and some problems, instead of receiving love and warmth and acceptance, you were rejected. Maybe you're carrying some church hurt. Maybe you were part of a church split that got ugly and you were forced to choose a side. And so through that, of no fault of your own, you, you lost people, you lost contact and connection with people that you deeply loved and you respected them and you were let down, even a sense of betrayal. I just want you to know that if that has gotten in the way of your relationship with God, that you're here by divine appointment today. I want you to know that we've been interceding for you. We've been standing in the gap that you would arrive here today and that you would encounter the love and the grace of God. Whether you're lost, whether you're wandering, whether you're wounded, you're here for the right reason and you're here in the right place today. You see, and that's what Paul was telling Timothy, we should be praying for those who need a mediator. We should be praying for those who need someone to intercede on their behalf, someone to get in the gap. Remember, as I said earlier, that it's our role to intercede, it's God's role to intervene. And you know what's so beautiful is that God knew that we needed him to intervene, that we are a sinful, broken people that by default, because of our sin, we cannot connect and commune or be in the presence of a loving and holy God. And so he needed to intervene, but he needed someone to intercede first. And you know who interceded? It was Jesus Christ, his son. He, he interceded for you and I. Let me show you this in scripture. In Romans chapter eight, verse 34, it says this. Who then is the one who condemns? Let me just simply say to you, if you're lost and you don't know God, there's no condemnation. If you've been wandering, I want you to know there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. If you're wounded, I want you to know that there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. It says this, who is, who is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of the Father and, and is also what? He's interceding for you. He's interceding for me. He's interceding for us. What has he done? There is a holy God and there is you and I and he has interjected himself and put himself in the middle and he's talking to God about us. He's working with God and saying, can we repair this breach? I'll stand in the gap. I'll die for them. I'll take their sin upon me. I'll take their disease upon me. I'll do whatever it takes, God, because I love them and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover them. I'm going to fight for them. I'm going to give everything for them. goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 the writer of Hebrews says therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him meaning those who come through Jesus Christ he is our mediator because he also or always lives to what intercede for them 
This is what Jesus does. He sits at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for you and I. He stands and he is the one that that is our great advocate. He is the one that speaks up on our behalf. When the accuser comes and says, look at there they are sinning again. There they are cussing again. There they are smoking again. There they are talking to that person they shouldn't be talking to. There's, there they are on, online again, looking at stuff they shouldn't be looking. And the stuff that makes us feel guilty, the things that are shame, Jesus says, by my blood, they've been forgiven. Their past has been erased. He is our great advocate. He is the one that intercedes. He's the one that put himself in the middle. He interceded so God the Father could intervene. Guys, this is good news. This is good news. This is the good news. This is the gospel. That when we couldn't pay our way, when we couldn't make our way to God, God made his way to us.